Welcome back to the Den of Tools. Howdy ho, guys and gals, it's Red, your friendly neighborhood tool bear, back again here in the Den of Tools, and you can tell I got my thinking cap on today. Why? Because we got to consider some big ramifications, that is the creation of the largest, I'm sorry, the fourth largest automotive manufacturing company in the world, and yep, that is the merger between Fiat, Chrysler, and Peugeot. By coming together, a 50-50 stock merger, they are going to be up there with all the big dogs coming up, you know, basically leapfrogging a bunch of other people to get up to the uh, the top of the pack, if you will. Now, last year, we were talking about that Fiat might be doing a merger with Renault. Then they had the sudden passing of the CEO of Fiat. And so that got put on hold and then didn't happen. A lot of us breathed a sigh of relief because we know that Fiat's had some issues with quality control. Uh, and Renault was well known for just not even dealing with quality control. But anyway, I don't want to talk a lot about FCA in this uh, video. We've talked a lot about them in the past. They have their vehicles here in the U.S., so we're pretty much up to speed. But that said, I, I should also mention that uh, I do have a Ram 1500. The wife has a, a Jeep Renegade. Both of these are FCA vehicles. We're not FCA fan bears or anything. It just happened to be the right vehicle at the right price at the time we were looking to shop around. We're not, you know, if you know the bear, I'm not a brand loyalist or anything like that. But anyway, I want to focus more on the Peugeot side of things because, uh, you know, most of our audience is here in the United States and we may not be as up to speed on Peugeot as to where they are these days now since they're no longer sold in the States. What we're talking about here is actually PSA Group. That's the parent company that owns Peugeot and a bunch of other brands under that, in much in the same way that Fiat Chrysler owns a bunch of brands as well. Now, French companies and such are known, well known for their quality pickup trucks, as well as they even have a Jeep type truck here. I have a picture of it surrendering right here. Okay, okay, the bear kids, the bear kids. All right, we got to get the surrender monkey cheese eating, you know, jokes out of the way up front. All right, back to the serious news. All right, I got to admit that back in the day, I really wanted a Peugeot. I wanted one of these Peugeot 500 turbos. When it came to, at least if you were into the sports sedan kind of market, this was one of the hot items if you could get your paws on it, which I couldn't find a good one at a price I could afford. And I ended up picking up instead a, a Saab 900 that I loved to death. Now, before a bunch of you roll your eyes and start talking about Detroit Muscle, Detroit Muscle, one of my best friends had this Plymouth Fury. I think it was a 66. He tried to find, follow me down a windy little back road in Kentucky, and his car ended up looking like this. Remember, being able to turn has its value too. All right. Now, anyway. All right, enough teasing the muscle car heads. Peugeot's made, been making some really nice cars for years. Uh, here's a picture of their 404, considered one of the classics out there. In fact, if you didn't know, any vehicle, at least in the European market, that has a three-digit number with zero in the middle has to be a, a Peugeot. In fact, they own essentially a trademark on it. Porsche, the 911, was originally called the 901, and when they brought it to, I think it was the Paris Auto Show, Peugeot walked over and said, uh-uh, you can't do that, and if you produce it, we'll have to sue you. Uh, Porsche didn't want to get into it with them, so they just struck out the middle number and put a one in its place, and that's how you get the Porsche 911. Hey, <laughs> you know who won that argument there? Anyway, the point of the matter really is that Peugeot has kept up with the times, and they're making some amazing cars these days. This, this thing is beautiful, and if you don't believe me, take a look at the interior. Wow, tell me that isn't you know, one of the nicest interiors you've seen on any modern kind of sedan. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous interior. And they that's not the only thing that they're doing well. They've got a great midsize SUV. They've just announced their new larger SUV. Now that said, that's European standards. This thing is going to be about the size of, say, a, uh, uh, a Kia Sonata. It's a midsize, a larger midsize SUV. So, you know, they do have some vehicles there that could compete in the U.S. markets, but they're not really going to be probably stepping on the toes of anything you see from Chrysler right now. Now, we don't know if they're actually going to be launched in the U.S. markets. We're, we're just talking about possibilities. You know, we got our thinking cap on. We got to think where this could go. Now, with, I touched on reliability before. Here's where comes the good news. There were a few years where Peugeot wasn't doing so great as far as reliability. In fact, many automotive manufacturers have dealt with that in the past. 
But these days, if you notice, here's a UK JD Power dependability study. Look who's up at number one there. That's Peugeot. Now, if you, if you look way, way, way down there, you can see Renault. And that's why we weren't too happy about Renault stepping in there. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes to reliability in Europe, a lot of people are looking to Peugeot. Hopefully, that can kind of cross over into the FCA world. Because ultimately, that's where the real savings for this merger is going to be, is in sharing platforms going forward. It's going to take years for this to really see an effect over here or over there. But at some point, sharing platforms, sharing parts and such like that, maybe we can start seeing that kind of dependability in Jeep and in uh, and in Ram and the other you know Dodge Chrysler kind of products that we'd like to see it in. Now, real quick, I want to talk about a couple of the other brands that they own, uh, and that is Citron. Of course, this is an old classic one. It's a beauty. They also own Opel, which they bought from GM. Now, <laughs> we'll talk more about that in a bit. Buick, if you didn't know, the Buick Regal here has, for the last oh handful or more of years, actually been a direct uh, Opel brought over from Europe, rebadged as a Buick. Now, the recent one is ba based off the platform, although it has many GM components. And it's not as Opel-y as it was before. And then they also have the DS. This is Europe's version of the smart car. If there's anything more intrinsically French than this thing, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but when you look at their where they're going with their concepts and stuff, that looks like a pretty sweet little ride to me. It looks like it would be at home in any street here in the U.S. I don't know. You tell me what you think about it. And, but when it comes to mergers, one of the things we got to talk about that has to be addressed is, but what are you doing when it comes to electric? And the reason I say that is every manufacturer, everywhere, everywhere in the world, every one of them, their number one talking point and where most of their R&D is going these days is going towards electric. Say what you will about electric. That's where the industry is going. That's what people want. So let's talk about facts and not about, you know, well, this is the grid can't handle it and all this. Yeah, I've heard that and I've also seen ways where the grid won't have a problem with it, especially when we get higher capacity batteries using the new sodium, you know, style batteries. Anyway, the point is this. Neither of these companies are doing well when it comes to electric. Fiat came out with a Fiat 500 EV that the CEO said, please don't buy. We lose money on every single one of them. And they're not alone, though. There's a lot of companies trying to catch up. Porsche, of course, owned by Volkswagen, which is one of the largest companies out there. Everyone thought this guy, this one was going to land and was just going to punch Tesla in the nose because they announced at 300 miles of range. That's going to be great, except it came in at 201. Yeah, that that's not exactly making, you know, Elon tremble in his boots there. <laughs> And then Volkswagen said, we're going to come out with, I think it's called the ID3, this hot hatch, you know, Volkswagen all electric, and it's going to be great, right? And then they immediately turned around and said, uh, but we're not going to launch it in the U.S. due to lack of demand. Due to lack of demand. Um, yeah. So this is the reason there's a lack of demand, because we have the Tesla Model 3. They can't touch Tesla. And why? Because Tesla has a huge head start. You can say what you will, and you lots. I know a lot of you hate Elon Musk and whatnot, and you're, you just despise the fact that he's got tons of money, makes great stuff, and sleeps with supermodels. I can understand there's a lot to hate about the guy. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm taunting you. I know I am. But the point of the matter is this. Just when it comes down to strictly business, they can't touch the Model 3, and no one else can. And as such, it doesn't even look like they're going to try. And then when Elon launched the, the idea of the Cybertruck with 500 miles, you know every automotive manufacturer out there said, we got to do something now or we're going to be we're going to be done. There's just no way we're going to be able to catch up with this guy. Well, <laughs> that's where it gets funny. They've been dealing with GM and they had this bright idea because they were sending Opals over there. And I know, every time I think of Opal, this is what I think of. But the point is that GM was also selling the Chevy Volt that had some good hybrid technology. But they also sold it in Europe under the Opal brand. So Peugeot got the bright idea that if they bought Opal, they would get the tech that goes along with this. And they figured, because Opal is not a very valuable brand, we could pick it up for cheap, right? So they buy it. Literally, cash deal, 
done. They get the deliverables. There's no tech for hybrid battery or anything in it. Seems like it was technology that was leased over, because you know how these companies do this internal kind of financials thing. <laughs> Peugeot asked for their money back, and they were told no. Sorry. Anyway, they recently, this, this year, Peugeot came out and said that they were coming out with an SUV with 200 miles of range. Well, at least they're not overshooting it. But again, not one of these vehicles is matching the Model 3's 220 mile range. And that's the worst car that Tesla makes. Let that sink in. The best that everyone else is doing is not touching Tesla's worst. Not good news if you're a major automotive manufacturer trying to get into the EV market. But then that leaves you thinking, well, if these guys, if they both suck at EV and they don't have, they're not planning to come over to the U.S. and Jeep isn't planning to go over to Europe. What is, what is the point of this merger? And honestly, that's why I have my thinking cap on because a lot of us are struggling trying to figure out what is the point of this merger. And in a lot of ways, you know what this feels like is you had two really strong companies with two, you know, great lines of cars and vehicles and whatnot. It kind of feels like that power couple who gets together just because it's like, hey, I'm really good looking. You're really good looking. We should be incredibly good looking together. <laughs> Not really because of any reason, but hey, let's shake on it and make that happen. Right. I don't know. What do you think? Is there any real benefit between these two companies coming together for the companies? Now, for me, you know, I like the Ram vehicles and stuff like that. And I, I'm a big fan of Jeep. I would love to see some of that uh, Peugeot reliability come over here. If it, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But that would be a benefit to me. But I can't really see anything else in there. Anyway, why don't you comment down below? Tell the bear what you think he got right, what he got wrong. I'm sure some of you be ranting about Elon Musk and calling his little thing a pyramid scheme. <laughs> I had a couple people comment on that, the whole down payment thing being a pyramid scheme. I think you all need to look up what a pyramid looks like. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't give you your money back when, when you say you don't want to do it anymore. Anyway, that's all the bear has for you. Don't forget to check out Tool Talk Live every Sunday. Yep, even this Sunday, Tool Talk Live, Tool, Tech, Family, business, so much more. Come by, say hi, 6 p.m. Pacific. Also, don't forget to get your copy of the Home Distillers Workbook, your guide to making moonshine, whiskey, vodka, rum, and so much more, written by my pet human. Don't forget to pick up your favorite De Bear mug, sticker, sweatshirt, T-shirt, and whatnot from the merch store. And last but not least, thank you to all the members who support the channel. Good news is, looks like YouTube's getting their act together, and we may be back on track here, so... Thank God for that, right? Anyway, that's all the bear has for you. Good night. God bless. And as always, shine on.